Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm your host, Bob DeMarco. Coming up, a new collaboration from Niche Designs. A $20 knife from Lowe's that impresses me and a list of 10 cold steel knives with ethnographic significance. Ethnographic, fancy word for saying these are famous knives from other cultures. And Cold Steel's uh, former chairman, the guy who started Cold Steel, Lynn Thompson, has a sprawling private collection of historical knives uh, from which he draws inspiration. So we're going to take a look at 10 of my favorites. Most of them, as you may have figured by now, <clears throat> are the large ones. Pardon me. So uh, we'll have a, a, a chance to take a look at some of my large cold steels. Uh, a, a collection that often, a sub-collection that often goes um, uh, neglected because it's not often I find myself carrying them. But I love having them, owning them, possessing them. All right, coming up, uh, pocket check right now. Let's do a pocket check. What are you carrying today? Let me know on the listener line, 724-466-4487, or leave a comment below. Uh, everyone likes to find out what everyone else is carrying, and uh, so let us know. Today in pocket, I have my new to me uh, Monterey Bay Knives Turbo. This is a Peter Carey design, um, beautifully executed. Monterey Bay Knives really... Their knives are really incredible. I've experienced three of them recently, and you're you're all like, "Yeah, Bob, we know, we know about Monterey Bay knives. We've had them for years." And but this has been my uh, my uh, for in, initial exposure to them over the past uh, several months. Lefty EDC, thank you for loaning me yours, and then uh, Owen, thank you for selling this to me. Sanford, I mean <laughs> Sanford. Uh, so beautiful, beautiful knife. Peter Carey, interesting guy. We had him on the podcast. Uh, one of the one of the first tactical folder custom knife makers out there. Still producing incredible work. You know, he just kind of makes work as he wants to, and uh, there is a pool of people ready to snap them up. Uh, they are incredible knives, and so he also licensed out a few of his designs to makers like Monterey Bay Knives and Spider Co. with the a Rubicon, and he had one other, and I always forget the name of it. Uh, so, yeah, Peter Carey designed Monterey Bay Knives Turbo in the right pocket, and in the left pocket, a fall classic, a fall favorite. This is a GEC number 15. This is a single-bladed pen or single-bladed spear point. Uh, in the autumn jig bone, I just love that color. I love the color of the of the uh, the bone handles on this, the bone covers on this knife. Uh, but it's also or just an excellent, excellent build. Uh, this is from 2018, and it's a very, very solid and stout slip joint knife. I mean, to me, this is one that uh, if you like single bladed slip joints, this is probably all you will ever need. If you use them, uh, this is a 1095 blade. Uh, what is it? It's uh, two and a half inches long, that blade. So, this is a classic boy's knife. Uh, the number 15 is a classic boy's knife in, in design and dimensions. And uh, they also make a 14, which is sort of a smaller version of this. I have a couple of those too, a single bladed spear point version of that too. And it's just a really, really useful knife. Now, the spear point blade has never been my favorite, especially on slip joints. I do like it when it has like the long machine uh, ground swedge and the long pull. To me, that's the best looking kind of uh, spear point blade. But, you know, are you going to find something as useful? It's got belly. It's got straight. It's straightforward. Uh, probably not. I mean, you know, clip point is up there. But I think this is just a solid, you know, th this is why the slip uh, Swiss Army knives all feature a main blade that shape. It's just incredibly useful. So this is what's in my pocket today. It's kind of an autumn choice in the left pocket and a new and slick choice in the right pocket. I've been um, finding myself circling back to flippers. You know me, everything is in a sine wave. I come in and out, I go through phases. I'm like an adolescent, you know, uh, at least with the knives. I'm, I'm, currently, I'm constantly going into a new phase. So for a while, with my front right pocket carry, I was in a thumb stud classic 
and, and I still am. You know, I I, I got the uh, again. I've, I've got one of these on me. That's a classic. It's a thumb stud knife. The uh, the omnum's on. But now I'm finding myself gravitating back towards flippers. It's because Dave got me that Civivi Keen Natter that I like so much. Uh, like, hmm, these these flippers. This is an interesting technology. Let me let me uh, let me gravitate back towards those for a while, and then and then I got this uh, turbo in hand, and it reignited the love of flippers. So right now I'm going kind of into a flipper phase, I guess, <sighs> or I'm talking myself into it. I don't know, um, but there you have it. Uh, so. This weekend, uh, my daughter sprung on us on Saturday, just as we're taking her to a birthday party, that she's got two major projects due on Monday. The child is very creative. The child is very lovely, sweet, thoughtful, extremely smart, uh, you know, insightful, pretty, of course. You know, she's my daughter, makes me laugh. But she's not the most organized. So she she drops this on us. What are the projects? Well, it comes down into two categories, luckily. One is my wife's category. Anything kind of academic she handles, anything art or, uh, you know, this weekend she has to make a pyramid. Like we all had to make a pyramid in sixth grade. Who among us didn't have to make a pyramid in sixth grade? So uh, this weekend has been all about sugar cubes and hot glue and... Um, you know, sugar cubes are are pretty exact in their measurements, but not exact exact. So what was I using to hew down uh, these giant slabs of sugar? I mean, you know, because I'm putting myself to scale. So these are giant slabs of sugar now uh, that we're fashioning to make this uh, this pyramid. By the way, this one opens up because you got to have an inside portion too to show. So there you go. Not in my day. We didn't have to do that. But now the kids, you know, they expect that. Um to get sugar cubes shaved to the proper size, I went to the kitchen junk drawer and grabbed this knife. And man alive, uh, this knife was featured on um, the Unsung Heroes show, where I showed you all the knives that kind of reside in different places in the house and in the car that get used a lot, but not, you know, their stories don't get sung far and wide like some of these other knives that do less work. Well, let's put it that way. So I went right for the LCK. This is a Ruger branded CRKT built knife uh, that I got a few years back when everyone was just going crazy about it. Nick Shabazz, um, Birdshot IV, uh, Stas, I think all the everyone I trust and love to watch was talking about what a great um, uh, well knife this is and what a great value at 30 bucks. It's on bearings and it's light and it's got a cool design. Matthew Lurch designed this hollow ground and just a great Warncliffe. Um, usually I like a pointier Warncliffe, you know that, because, you know, I got to be able to thrust it into the into the uh, the foes I need to vanquish. Uh, but in this case, the, the point never bothered me. That sort of almost, you know, uh, I don't know. Well, it's kind of a, it's just not a very acute angle there. Uh, hasn't bothered me on this. So anyway, this, if you're wondering, and if you have a sugar cube pyramid in your future and you need to shave sugar without it like crumbling or, or, or coming off in huge chunks, but you need to be precise and shave off, you know, a 16th of an inch of a sugar cube. Let me tell you, let me, let me reassure you that this uh, Ruger LCK made by CRKT is an adequate, if not awesome choice. Uh, actually, I found myself using the choil, like I was making damn feather sticks, like this. So, ladies and gentlemen, this, this is the kind of hard use my knives get. Um, they don't get much hard use. Uh, sometimes I put them through the paces in the backyard, but when the rubber, you know, not the rubber, when the um, when it all comes down to it, and I'm really needing a knife in a pinch, and I go to the, the junk drawer. I got to say, this this little $30 LCK is all I needed. I did have a I did have the turbo in my pocket that day, too, because it was new to me. Do you think I was going to shave sugar with the turbo? No, not that I didn't think that M390 blade could handle it, but I didn't want to get a little sugar dust in the in the action. So I got precious with it, kept it in my pocket, went for this $30 LCK. In 8CR13 MOV, it did the trick. Didn't even need to restrop. All right. So if you're wondering, long-term long test results of the CRKT LCK. Uh, it's done a lot of work in the kitchen drawer, kitchen junk drawer. 
And uh, yesterday I discovered at, uh, what, a, what a precise instrument indeed it is. All right, so I, I think I'll have to uh, uh, take some pictures of this knife and sing its song and give it a little praise, put it up on Instagram, and, uh, uh, and I'll let you know when I do. You know how you'll know? You'll go to Instagram and say, oh, Bob posted something there. Awesome. Because I, I've been I've been slacking lately on on the Instagram, but uh, I got some good advice recently, and I'm going to follow it. So, boom. Uh, also, if you think what we do here is interesting and you want to help support the show, you can do it on Patreon. Just go to the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Check out our different tiers. We have $10. That's the Gentleman Junkie. We have the $5 tr um, Tactical Junkie and the $3 Traditional Junkie. Different levels of support. You get a lot of different things. Uh, at each one, but on the on the um, ten dollar level, the gentleman junkie they get enrolled in a monthly knife giveaway. So that's that's an exciting thing. That's always a uh, a good time. The third Thursday of every month on Thursday night knives, we give away a knife to a gentleman junkie. Spin the wheel and find out who gets it. It's all randomized. A couple of people have won more than once. So anyway, uh, get in on it. Your chances of winning are still pretty good. Uh, so that's the knife junkie.com slash Patreon, the knife junkie.com slash Patreon. You're listening to the knife junkie podcast. And now here's the knife junkie with the knife life news. Uh, before I get into some of the new, uh, I got two new knife stories coming up that are exciting to me. Uh, and hopefully to you. But before we get to that, I just saw something. I went on Knife Magazine, great, uh, great website, Knife Magazine, and great magazine. Of course, they they all are in print, large like the old Life Life Magazine, in uh, in in color. And if you're if you don't know what a magazine is, it's kind of like the internet on paper. All right, I borrowed that from Seth McFarland, by the way. All right, so uh, I saw this in Knife knife magazine and it's lucky to be alive crock versus pocket knife and uh apparently this 60 year old man uh was out and about in australia of course and uh he got uh attacked and tried to uh you know by a three meter or three and a half meter crocodile and uh that's basically a what, like 12, 13 foot crocodile. And he got away from it. And this is unprecedented. A, a, a 13 foot crocodile sinks its leg, uh, sinks its, fa its fangs, its, its ancient dinosaur teeth into your leg and tries to pull you into the river, roll you on the bottom. You're probably going to die. But this guy, this 60 year old dude uh, had the wherewithal to remove his pocket knife and repeatedly stab this thing in the head over and over until it let go of him. And he survived. Now, I talk about this all the time. I, I I talk about this with my daughters. I talk about this with my wife until they're tired of hearing it. But um, there are so many great movies where you see how a pocket knife saves the day. So many great movies. Uh, and in this case, this is real life. This is not a crocodile Dundee Bowie that was uh, that was slammed into the skull of this thing. This was a pocket knife. I don't even know what it was, but in Australia, who knows? It was probably a Victorinox because I think they have pretty strict knife laws down there. So uh, stabbing this thing in the head with a with a pocket knife, it lets go. This man defeated a dinosaur with a folding knife. So if you if if people ever ask you why do you carry knives, what's your thing with knives, uh, you can tell them about cutting threads off of your collar. You can tell them about cutting your sandwich or or even, you know, making fire sticks. But you can also tell them about this story uh, because, you know, we are not the top of the food chain uh, all the time. Yes, we have our thumbs, our opposable thumbs and our big brains. So we're usually top of the food chain. But every once in a while, a crocodile will, will get the best of us. So make sure we have our technology in our pocket, our best, finest, first, and most effective technology in our pocket. That is the knife. Pull it out, stab that damn crocodile in the head, and live another day. So I love that story. Uh, it just, you know, it's it's a real life version of that thing I preach to my daughters <laughs> that, that bores them. They don't hear me anymore. All right, uh, a new thumb stud version from the from tactile knives of the rock wall, and I'm very excited about this. And Dag Nabbit, I had my rock wall all all day flipping it around, ready for the story, and I left it somewhere. Uh, but okay, we all know the tactile knives rock wall. Tactile turn uh, a famed well. 
let's just put it this way, a loved, much loved and respected pen company in Texas from the pen people, uh, known for their incredible titanium turning and texture making and, and such, started making knives. They really blew up with the tactile rock wall, their first knife, which is a flipper. Looks just like the one on screen, except with a flipper tab. Now the big story is they are making it with a thumb stud. And I got to say, I love that. If this were a little, uh, this is a three inch knife, okay? Three inch bladed knife. So if this were a little three inch um, frame lock, I would say stick to the flipper because with for me the smaller the the frame lock the harder it is for me to use the um thumb studs so but the beauty of this is the rock wall is a titanium liner lock something i've really started falling for uh the turbo is a liner lock titanium liner lock you get amazing action um <clears throat> So uh, the thing that thrills me is that this is a liner lock. So the thumb studs, you're not gonna slow down the action by pinching on the frame lock in this case, because it's a liner lock. So I'm really happy about this. It looks like it's gonna be uh, a, I mean, I love the way it looks. And you know me, I, I, did, I dig the thumb studs. So I think this is a great move. And their whole quest to make this knife fit inside uh, the confines of the old fashioned five stick pack of Wrigley's gum. Uh, if you're old enough to remember what that is, uh, is even greater realized without that, uh, without the pocket pecker sticking out the back. So there you go. Tactile knives, just killing it with the, with the rock wall and, and their Bexar, the, um, clip point slip joint <laughs> that they have and, uh, and their chef's knife. So great guys over there. We also, we talked to, uh, we talked to them here on the show. So if you want to find out what what's going on behind the scenes there and what their plans are uh, for the for the future. Check it out. All right, next, Nick Rogers. You know Nick Rogers, uh, Niche Designs. Uh, he designed the Ingress, uh, a knife that I have the prototype to that I, that I love so much. Well, uh, that Ingress didn't get fully funded, so they never got made widely. So a number of us lucky folks got the We Made prototypes. Uh, but... Um, the knife didn't go into wide distribution. Bummer. Uh, so two years later, year and a half later, he comes back with a collaboration with Artisan Cutlery. Artisan Cutlery can can hardly think of a better Chinese brand to collaborate with um, in terms of in terms of uh, you know having your design made to great great standards. So the here it is. It's called the Ahab. Uh, it is. Um, tip of the hat to, uh, I, I guess it's because it's a harpoon. It's a harpoon um, Warncliffe here. There's a slight curve on that Warncliffe blade, but it is a harpoon. I'm, I'm thinking maybe, and even that body looks kind of sperm whale-ish if, if you look at it. Even with the pivot, looks a little bit like an eye. Um, so Ahab, you know, uh, captain of uh, uh, Moby Dick, searching for his white whale. So here we go. Uh, I, I think it's a, a beautiful knife. I think it's cool. But more than that, um, it's going to be a Nick Rogers design that is widely distributed. Uh, Nick Rogers, a young designer. He's uh, he's made a number of other products besides knives. And uh, he's just a young and creative force that uh, I want to see, you know, succeed. And this is a great, a great sign that he is. <laughs> I don't uh I think it's a, a cool knife and I think I will probably get one as I am a Warren Cliff lover. And I do like the shape of that handle. It looks like it will be comfortable in all of my preferred grips. So do check out uh it's coming out uh I think it's next month here. The niche designs uh that's Nick Rogers collaboration with artisan cutlery the Ahab harpoon um, folding worn cliff knife. And it does come in uh, three materials, G10, micarta, and that gorgeous olive wood handle there. I, was like, olive? I think that was olive wood. Uh, or I mean, rosewood, rosewood, like a guitar. All right. So still to come, the state of the collection, we're going to check out a, an arcane design knife. We're going to check out a, a knife I bought at Lowe's that uh, shows that the times they are a changing. And then we're going to take a look at 10 cold steel folders of ethnic significance. Stick around.
The GetUpside app is your way to get cash back on your gas purchases. GetUpside is an app you put on your smartphone, and whenever you need to get gas, search your area for savings, claim your discount, fill up your tank, and then take a picture of the receipt with your phone. And that's it. You've just got cash back. Visit theknifejunkie.com forward slash save on gas to get the app and start saving. Again, that's theknifejunkie.com slash save on gas. At Lowe's, looking for spray paint that looks like sand. Found it, was very excited. And then, of course, with that mission complete, the real mission, I have to go check out the cutting tools section because I am in a store that sells cutting tools. <clears throat> I go and I see this. This is in a clamshell package. It's open like this. And the first thing I see is that pivot. So this is a Crescent Tools knife here. And they even call it an EDC on the package. Uh, I did a little video when I got home and opened this because I, I was just pleasantly surprised and pleased at how um, all of the all of the things that we as knife enthusiasts are starting to demand in our knives have trickled down to the twenty dollar hardware store knives, basically. And uh, the first thing that signaled that to me was that pivot. It reminded me of a Wii pivot or a, you know any any sort of branded pivot, which is a kind of a big thing right now. And I, and I, I saw that I was like, Ooh, okay, let's take a look. And then I saw the handle and that the <clears throat> thing that impressed me first was the shape of the finger, uh, choil. I was like, Oh, okay. Uh, something, uh, this is going for style. It's going for a little bit of style because I have to believe th that it would be easier to put a, a regular curve, like a, like a, just a circular half circular curve there for the choil. Uh, it would be easier, but they took a little time to design that. And, and then I thought, okay, let's look at the access to the to the lock. And I look at the access to the to the lock, and I see that it's very nicely chamfered in, in sort of a crescent shape. And uh, so I'm seeing all this through the clamshell. I'm like, I, I got to get this. And I, I read the back, and they say deep carry pocket clip, 5 CR15 MOV, wah, 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 and uh, and then FRN handle. This is, by the way, some of the best FRN. It's it's a little heavy, though. I, mean, I can I can tell that it's heavy FRN, but it feels really good. So, so I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, here we go. And then I look at the package, and it says bearing action. I'm like, bearing action? This is awesome. It's not, it's not, you know, Two years ago at Lowe's, two years ago at Home Depot, everything was still assisted. And then things are, had slowly started to change with some of the Gerber knives. Uh, though they weren't going for action, they also weren't, um, uh, they, they weren't going for action and achieved it. And, uh, but they also weren't assisted. Now we're starting to see bearing pivots. We're starting to see branded pivots. We're starting to see details like this landing spot in the liners for the flipper. That's something from the knife world. We're seeing jimping. That's ceremonial. It doesn't do any work. This is hollow ground, by the way, very nicely hollow ground. Um, and then on this chamfer, there's texturing. I mean, this thing is, is a pretty, it's heavy. Look at this deep carry pocket clip. They're doing something that a lot of top brands are not doing over there at Crescent Tools. Look at that. The deep carry pocket clip is nestled in a milled out spot there, and it's got totally flush screws. This is not going to hang up on your car hearts when you're using this on the job site at all. And to me, that is like such, I, I don't know why that's not happening all the time, period. Um, you know, I know I get milling out the spot may, it, is extra money, but what about the flat screws? Is it that much extra money to, to, to chamfer the holes of the, of the, of the pocket clip, you know, to, to fit the shape, that sort of wedge shape of flat screws in there. I, I can't imagine it's that much, but it's a little, it's a little detail. That means a lot. Those screws chew up your pockets. And if you're a working man or woman and, uh, you need your knife, and you don't want to be buying new pants all the time because you you look like a bum because it's your your pockets all torn up. Here you go, look at that, nicely done crescent tools. So I, I'm impressed by this. The one thing is the five CR fifteen MOV. 
Uh, seems like for 20 bucks, maybe you can get D2 on there. I don't know. Maybe not. But five and five CR15, I, I have on my uh, um, CRKT minimalist, you know, and it's 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 fine for a little bit. But if this is a working knife, you might have to strop this midday. I don't know. Uh, the five CR that I've experienced is not great. All right. So, but I'm very impressed by this and very interested to see, like, you know, I used to work uh, in um, the fashion world, shooting video and editing video and uh, edited video from like all of the top, top fashion shows in, uh, in Rome, Mil I mean, in Milan, in Paris and in America, in the United States and in Tokyo. And you would see these crazy fashions and colors and you're like, what? No one's going to wear that. And then two years later, you're in the Gap or Old Navy. You see the color. The color has trickled down and you see the collar. Oh, look at that. The collar from that crazy thing I saw has trickled down or like now there you see trends uh, coming from the very top come to the, the more pedestrian level. Uh, over a, a, the course of a few years, and I and I recognize that immediately with this knife. This this represents that to me, the trickle down of a of 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 knife connoisseur details into a twenty dollar uh, work knife at Lowe's. So happy to see that. Putting that down. Next, got this. Uh, this is on loan from Israel Bacchus of Arcane Design, and this is his new design the ultra cool abyss this is his take on a bowie knife his futuristic uh, as usual you know that's what he does he does he does uh, futuristic sci-fi inspired designs and then he has them produced by uh, best tech or uh, riot and they do gorgeous gorgeous work and uh i think they do his designs justice they are really interesting to look at so this is his bowie and to me, uh, you know, I'm a I'm a Bowie fan, fanatic, lover, um, and I think this is a uh, Bowie Tanto. To me, this is a clip point Tanto. But I'm not going to argue with the man who designed it himself. This this could you could call this a Bowie, just a compound ground Bowie. So you see this bottom straight area here is hollow ground and very very sharp and thin. And then that front portion is flat ground like a tanto, but also extremely sharp. As a matter of fact, I was talking on Thursday Night Knives the other night about how this front portion, this flat, is unbelievably sharp, like sharper than I expected. I, I was expecting this hollow grind to really wow me, and it did. Uh, um, this has been through a number of other hands and probably needs to be stropped up a touch, but this front portion does not. It's so sharp. Um, but so you have the, this hollow ground meeting, grind meeting that flat grind with that curved line right here. So beautiful. This is hard to see because of the, um, stone washing, the acid stone washing on it. Uh, but it's got three really nice sharp jimps on the top that really capture your hand. This would be great with gloves. Uh, wouldn't want to do too much hard work with this knife with that jimping with my thumbs there because it is a little aggressive. But uh, for what you're probably going to be using this for, um, uh, much welcome. You've got a really cool swedge on the top of the blade um, that does not go down to the tip and uh, just leads to a very interesting look. I love the fuller. The fuller can be used. I know you're wondering. It can be used to spidey flick it, but it's not a very... Yeah, I guess I'm getting better at it. It's not a very deep channel to to grab your your finger fat <laughs> to to get purchased to whip out that blade. Uh, really cool ergonomics. The handle design is so great to look at, like and and, and is reminiscent of some of his other designs, um, but surprisingly feels incredible in hand. You look at those angles and the lines and the facets. And you think it might be, it might feel uh, a little sharp, but it doesn't. It feels incredible in hand and nestles in very nicely. I have one ergonomic beef with this knife, and that is this area right here. Right here, this edge at the very end at the pommel. Uh, I wish that that were chamfered because I can feel it in some grips. 
And uh, but I mean, you know, definitely not a deal breaker. And it and, and I don't feel it all the time. And I don't suspect that it would bother me much unless I was using the knife on a hard task repeatedly, which I, you know, me, I wouldn't. I would have something. I would have the <laughs> the LCK in hand to do that. Uh, so just a beautifully uh, designed knife here, really nicely executed. Uh, I I also my other little my other oh that's where I feel it when I close it. I feel this against my palm, and it's kind of sharp, but you know, not to be too much of a a, a you know precious snowflake here but uh, right here uh, i wouldn't mind a l slightly larger flipper tab uh, because it sits in this thumb well here and is short sometimes i have found myself coming off of this and kind of missing it a little bit coming off this front portion but again it's a it's a getting used to it thing it is nicely jimped so it does grab your finger quite well uh these are available uh you can uh see they have different different uh colorways and i believe one of them is damasteel uh so go to the arcane design website check it out and of course check out israel bacchus and arcane design on instagram it's uh it's pure eye candy uh like i said he's a he's a sci-fi nut he loves the future uh you know he loves sci-fi futuristic stuff and he always photographs his knives and and uh juxtaposes pictures of his knives with pictures of the universe or weird uh, trippy kind of uh, futuristic things. Hang on, uh, before I get, uh, before I put this knife down, I just wanna show it with my, uh, with my Arcane Design knife. This is a, a collaboration with Something Obscene Company and Arcane Design. It's the uh, um, antimatter and it is a double-edged dagger, pretty like 100% symmetrical design and just again it, you see some of the same design um vocabulary and you get the same really in incredible build and some of those uh oh, beautiful features futuristic features so i'm very very uh, excited about the abyss congratulations israel on on the release of this and uh i i hope to see one in my collection sitting right next to the antimatter in in the future I hope. Okay, so next up, before before we go on to the top, to my cold steel ten cold steel knives with ethno ethnic significance, I want to show off a knife that I've shown here before. It's a knife that I made, so this is a little self serving, uh, but uh, it's it's reached its final state. It was in this weird flux state for a long time, and I, I fixed it. I changed it. So this is my road warrior knife. It is a, uh, a chisel ground. It's flat on this side. Chisel ground A E B L Warren Cliff at let's see one, two, three, four. it's about five and a half inches long. It's extremely sharp. And I had it heat treated to about uh, 60, 61 Rockwell by uh, the great and powerful Alex Steingraber. Uh, at the time he was doing that, I'm not sure if he's still doing that for knife makers, um, but. Not that I'm calling myself a knife maker, but after I spoke with him, uh, I sent this to him and he, he treated it for me. And, and um, I think he did a great job. So I put a pretty nice and sharp uh, chisel ground edge on this and I used it to make feather sticks once for uh, the uh, the fire pit out back. And uh, the, the chisel grind works really nice to do that, you know, because you have this flat portion that you just ride it right on the piece of wood, but you just cant it up ever so slightly and you just get incredible uh shaving with this uh you got to learn how to control it actually it's it's easy to overshoot and just like cut piece slice pieces of wood off so you have to kind of control it but any anyway if you remember this knife i i sent it to alex before drilling the holes in the handle uh and he heat treated it and i just cannot get drill a drill through this and i know i've gotten all sorts of recommendations for different drill bits and stuff and i gotta be honest i just don't have didn't have the patience at the time. So I glued glued the micarta checkered handles on there that were originally intended for uh, a coal, you know, for a 1911 handle and uh, just epoxy the hell of them uh, out of them. And then I wrapped paracord, purple paracord in that sort of Japanese style, you know, kind of 
street Japanese style around it. And I was like, okay, that works. That'll hold the scales on in case the epoxy fails, but it just looked goofy. And then, um, I decided the thing to do, it already looks kind of primitive was to wrap it in jute twine and then shellac it. And I did that and it feels great in hand. First of all, it's a little less thick with the paracord that I was using. It was 550 paracord, wasn't gutted. And it really, you know, kind of, it gave it too much girth in the hand. Uh, this jute cord is great. And I think it feels, well, it feels great, but I think it looks really cool. And it's shellacked on there. And then the handle scales are epoxied and it's not going anywhere. So I, I think uh, this week I'll, I'll make a Kydex sheet. I say that. I've been saying that for, for almost two years now about some of these knives. I hate making sheets because half the time I botch them. And, and it's a it's a long, long enough process that I don't like enough that botching one is enough to make you or enough to make me not want to do it. But this is sort of a Fred Perrin inspired knife. And uh, it's obviously optimized for for mayhem. <laughs> so if I do make a Kydex sheath, I'm going to figure out how to wrap it in leather. I think it needs to be in leather, just the way it looks, because it looks so rough. All right, so that's the update on my on my uh, Road Warrior knife. Uh, stay tuned for part 12, the sheath. Okay, now, cold steel folders. Uh, I, okay, all right, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm at a stage right now where I've always wanted the Talwar. The Talwar is now available in S35VN in uh, serrated, which I think I might want more, or plain edge. And I just haven't jumped on it for some reason. I think maybe it's the expense. And it's not like I don't have plenty of knives that cost that, that are considerably smaller and less strong. But uh, I don't know. So so that inspired me. I think I need to get it. But I was like, let me look at what I have, and I have, I have a pretty uh, pretty nice uh, extra large cold steel collection. I was like, let me look at it, and 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 I it struck me. I'm like, okay, so this knife, the Talwar, that's uh, you know roughly Persian, roughly Middle Eastern, you know, um, in design with that upswept blade and everything like that. Um, that's an ethno design. What like what other? And then I look in my drawer, and everything they do has some sort of um, ethnic uh, tip of the hat. Not not tip of the hat. That's not the right word. Um, inspiration, inspiration. So the first one is inspired by the the American knife, the Bowie. So we're going to start our ethnic series with America, USA, right here, United States of America, the Bowie knife. That's not to say that clip point blades didn't exist before the Bowie knife, but the Bowie knife pretty much codified it. Uh, we're going to see a clip point blade later uh, from a different place before America was really America. So, all right. So here we go. This is the Recon 1. This is the CTS XHP version. And it is, it is a very powerful knife. If you look at this, it's an inch and a half wide and full flat ground. So it is, and not very thick, you know, I don't have my, I think, what is that? An eighth of an inch thick maybe. And it comes to such a sharp edge. It's, it's incredible what, how they ground these blades. Uh, and then it's coated. The XHP is coated. Interesting thing. You're going to see uh, the other recon one later, the Tanto also XHP. They have a different coating. The the Bowie here has a sort of a dull coating that you can never quite, you know, it, it's always kind of looks a little marred. It looks a little dirty always. You can kind of polish it up, but goodness, this thing is sharp. So this uh, last thing I ever used this for, I went for, this was over a year ago now, but I went to the, uh, we have a little bamboo thicket and I cut down some bamboo and this would go right through a, an inch and a half um, you know, bamboo thing at an angle, like it's not even there. You know, bamboo is not the uh, not the hardest material to cut through, but for a pocket knife, it's pretty impressive. So that's the Recon One Bowie, and that's a, a United States, you know, eth ethnic. Uh, it's a cultural a milestone from the United States. Okay, next is the Raja Two. Now, this knife is no longer in production. I don't know why they did that. 
they they stopped making the rajas but it's their kukri look at this thing it's giant it's a this one is a six inch uh os eight blade my brother got this for me as a housewarming gift when we moved into this house oh 10 years or so ago 11 years ago and uh this is great housewarming gift i've had people comment that this is a uh um counterfeit and and i think that those people were looking at some cues from the newer designs this one is considerably old uh i know they changed the pocket clip situation a little bit they did they did some other things uh also with them with the markings um and as i told those people like i'm i'm you know 99% sure this isn't a uh, a fake but if it is it's good enough it doesn't matter it'll do till the real thing gets here now this this is an incredible knife for uh, brush for outdoor use i mean this would make an excellent camp knife because here let's go wide here for a second if you choke down on the blade here you have this much reach and that's my real that's about 12 inches you you have a lot of reach so you could use that with that recurve with this uh with this kukri recurve here and all of that reach you can use this to swipe down you know saplings and you've got you've got the uh triad lock here so it's most likely uh going to keep you in good stead that whole time most likely i mean you know things do happen sometimes but i don't think the failure will be with the triad lock. So the second one, the Raja 2, this is uh, based on the Kukri from Nepal, the uh, preferred weapon of the famed uh, Gurkha soldiers that the, uh, the, the Brits, um, the British army employed for a long time. I think they still do. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, but it has this thumb plate and that thumb plate. Oh, yes, I know they do, actually. That thumb plate is uh, a great place to put your thumb and also to open up your blade. Wave it open. Actually, I just said I know I do. I'm talking out of school. I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. But my brother-in-law did some special training with uh, with both British soldiers and Gurkha Kukris, uh, Gurkha, Gurkha soldiers, and ended up with a really cool Kukri that was in, engraved and, and everything. Uh, so that that's a that's how I thought I knew. All right, next is the Frenzy. Now the Frenzy, uh, this is a five and a half inch XHP also, or is this S35? Can't remember, let's see. This is S XHP also. So when I saw this, my first thought was, oh, it's a pocket Gnumting. Um, Lynn Thompson has been doing Pekiti Tertia or, or, or some sort of Kali for a long time. So I know he knows about the Gnumting. Uh, which is sort of a sickle-shaped downward short sword that uh, that is very popular in the southern Philippines and uh, uh, and and in use currently with their special marines down there. And I thought that this was a version of that, but it isn't. So this is a, um, as most of these are, this is a uh, Andrew Demko design. Excuse me for the coffee sip. This is an Andrew Demko design and his father had a an aikido studio all grown up so he's uh, a, a japanese martial artist and so he designed this knife uh, andrew demko designed this knife after a japanese knife called the uh, kabuto wari that is used for stabbing through helmets and armor and it's just a nasty knife <laughs> with a with a with a you know very purpose driven knife whether you think it reminds you of a ganunting or wh whether it reminds you of a kabuto wari it's this sort of uh, open-armed approach to all blade designs that I love about Cold Steel. This is a five and a half inch knife with G10 liners and all of that. And or wait, no, no, this doesn't have liners. It's so light and so thin that you can actually carry this if your pocket is deep enough. You know, as long as you're not wearing your skinny jeans, this would fit in skinny jeans with wise, but I'm sure skinny jeans have shallow pockets. So you can just put your little credit card in there, uh, but this wouldn't fit in there. But but regular jeans, regular pants, uh, khakis, even this is. A, I mean, I've this this could be a work knife. Uh, so uh, it's very large, but very discreet in how thin and slender and light it is. So this is the Kabuto Wari, the Frenzy, uh, or alternately in my universe, the Pocket Gununting.
All right, next is an ethnographic design from the ancient past. This is the Immortal. The Immortal. Uh, based on the uh, Gladius. This is uh, inspired by the Roman Gladius, this, the, the legionnaire sword. So in the Roman army, they first started with the Falcata, which was the, it looked like a large kukri, uh, also called a copus. Uh, it's a, it's a sword, a blade design that came from the Iberian uh, peninsula that, that, uh, uh, that Alexander the Great, I think first took and spread it throughout uh, the, the continent. And then I think that was the early sword of the Romans. Um, and then they were discovering that they were doing too much slashing and there were too many living bodies on the battlefield and they had to employ pikemen to go around and stab them all. And so to save money, they changed sword design to, to this, the thrusting sword, the, the short thrusting sword, the gladius, and trained the soldiers to thrust instead of slash, thus dispatching their foes right there without having to employ and pay pikemen to go around and clean up afterward. So that's what this knife is based on. And uh, man, leave it to cold steel again. So this is, this is a, uh, um, oh, man, I'm so sorry. The gentleman who designed this, uh, Mike, um, ah, the gentleman who designed this, his name escapes me at the moment, but he's a partner of Andrew Demko works in his design shop, Mike. And then I can't, Ah, forgive me. I will put it in the notes below. Uh, but this is like some of the others, a hollow ground straight here with a flat ground forward portion. So essentially it's a tanto. It's a tanto that has a mirror. Um, you know, it's like a mirror image tanto. And uh, I would imagine great for thrusting a bit like a dagger. That's a diamond point right there, but also excellent at cutting. Uh, on in this grip here. Uh, I find this knife to be very comfortable. And the funny thing is, is Jimmy Slash, uh, who is a huge Cold Steel fan, did not like this knife, did not, did not like the way it felt in hand. And um, I actually really do like how it felt, feels in hand. And I have a feeling our hands are very, very different. He's a, he's a, he's like a power lifter and a, and a, you know, he's a big dude. And uh, I could see how, he, I think he thought the channels on the side um, redirected his fingers in an uncomfortable way. So interesting. That's an old video. You can go check that out. But so there it is, the immortal uh, the, with the Imperial Rome connection. Next, with the Japanese connection, we keep coming back to Japan. This is the Kiridashi. This is the probably the one, yes, definitely the one small folder in this uh, list here. The Kiridashi based on the Japanese utility knife that a lot of people use, uh, whether you're a carpenter, woodworker, or just using it for general utility. The Kiridashi is... Um, is known by its straight edge and triangular shaped blade, a um, bit of a Warncliffe, Japanese Warncliffe, if you will. Uh, and I'm sure you will because you have no choice. I'm going to say it. It's a Japanese Warncliffe, and it's got uh, really nice FRN handles with cool sort of uh, texture evocative of like a basket weave pattern. And just fits your four fingers, just fits my four fingers, might not fit Jimmy's four fingers. It's got a lanyard hole. And uh, I don't know why I haven't put a lanyard on this. This is the kind of knife I like to put a lanyard on. And it's got this weird clip on the back. I know you're looking at that clip. What's up with the clip? So this harkens back to the old days when, when the clip was molded, um, uh, molded onto the FRN handle or as part integral to the FRN handle. That's like how they were done originally with uh, Spider Co. and Cold Steel. And uh, Cold Steel has come back to that for some of their folders. Um, I think the Double Safe Hunter does that, a couple of others uh, as well. On this knife, it works great. It's so comfortable. It fills out uh, the hand. It makes the handle wider, uh, first of all. But the broad shape of it and the, and the general contour to the outer contours of the knife itself make the knife feel more substantial in hand. So if you are a big guy, but you want to use this little utility knife and just carry it around, but feel sure in hand, that clip 
really does a great job. It also does a great job of actually carrying it. The one thing I don't like is what it looks like coming out of the pocket, but that's not, that's me being shallow again. Okay, so this is uh, a, a special steel, not a special steel. It's 4034 stainless steel, 4034 stainless steel. It's very soft. It gets very sharp. But, you know, if this is something you're going to be using all the time, you're going to want to strap it up at the end of the day for sure. Uh, so here it is, the Kiridashi, uh, the folding Kiridashi. I have a Kiridashi neck knife from them also. It's just a great utility design. It's, it's interesting, uh, kind of like any culture you go to, utility designs are usually straight edge like this. Think of the Stanley carpet knife. Think of the Japanese Kiridashi. Think of the Warncliffe. Okay, next up comes from Scotland. Yes, that's right. Uh, a modern and very large folding interpretation of the ski and do, the small sock knife that uh, the Celts, or, or I'm sorry, the, uh, the Scots, Scottish men wear in their socks, you know, that little knife. Well, that's what this is based on. This is uh, the Holdout 1, and the Holdout series goes from 3 inches to 4 inches to 6 inches, uh, the, the Holdout 1, 2, and 3. And uh, the 3 is probably the closest to the real thing in terms of size because it's 3 inches in length. I'd really like to get that one. Incidentally, it's S35VN. It's great. Looks like a great little knife. Uh, but a re-release. So grateful for that. Uh, this knife beckoned to me ages ago because it was 40 bucks. And uh, I wasn't crazy about the design. I thought it was pretty plain, but it was 40 bucks. And I had a uh, four inch that I got rid of at one point, the holdout two. I got this one and I was like, oh, okay. This is how I like the holdout. It is a nice big knife. And with those serrations, good gracious, it is a... Uh, it, it will shear through anything. I mean, imagine, well, don't imagine. It will shear through anything. Uh, you've got the lightning holes on the handle here that are that are nicely scooped out here. So they feel just, they feel great in hand. And when you wrap your fingers around the handle, one or two of them will sink into those holes. Uh, and not only, so not only do they add lightness to the whole design, but they add great grip. They also are, are opposed, you know, they also perfectly oppose one another. So if you're going to do some sort of manipulation, I'm not going to try and do it here. I'll knock into my light, but uh, if you're going to change grips in a sort of quick way, you can index using these, you can pivot using these. And uh, especially on the smaller versions of this knife. I mean, I, I wouldn't be too cavalier about flipping this thing around. It's huge. It's thin. It's fully flat ground. It's serrated. Uh, it's just nasty. Uh, eight, uh, this is Aus 8A, a US 8A steel, which, uh, t t today's standards is, you know, uh, uh, kind of a, a, a slouch steel, but in reality it's fine. And the way cold steel does it, it's awesome. So have never had really any trouble with the Aus 8. Then again, never been much of a hard user and repetitive tasks. So, you know, I could see how that might be an issue. All right, next up also comes from the ancient world. This is based on the Copus, or like I was talking about before, it's its forebearer, the Falcata. This is the Spartan. Um, this came out shortly after 300, a fantastic movie, and uh, uh, took its cues from the, from the sword in that movie because that movie had the coolest swords ever. Uh, a very big one. This is an old version of the Spartan. It is big. It is heavy. I This was an EDC for a while. I was carrying this when my daughter, my first daughter was born. I was in the hospital with this. I'm like, no one's going to take my daughter. I was such a spaz. Uh, but, you know, this was in my pocket and I was ready for anything. Um, there it is. Look at that giant blade. So uh, when you when you look this up, they say inspired by the Kukri. And yes, I'm sure it was. But but also, if you look at the old Copus and the old Falcata, you'll see handles similar to that with that extreme bird's beak wrapping around the, the back of your hand. And you'll see a, uh, a really deeply recurved blade. Just horrifying, horrifying and scary. Uh, when you look at this one, the Spartan, it looks like a big recurved uh, uh, Bowie to me. 
uh, or I mean, yes, Kukri too, but it looks like a big clip point to me. That's where my mind goes. It's got the uh, incredible thumb plate that really is a nice landing spot for your, uh, for your thumb, but also you can use it to wave open the blade on your pocket. I have a poor man's bead on here. This is just a two little knots and a, and a, and a nut uh, works for me. And I sanded the blade on this one because this was the first version of this and it was bead blast. And I just don't like bead blast and bead blast. Uh, uh, you know, I had this in my cargo pants pockets 10 years ago, uh, sweating my butt off in Virginia and that blade would rust up. Uh, because when you blast something like that, you're creating, you know, billions of tiny little pockets in the surface. And each one of those little pockets can attract and retain moisture. And so they, it rusts easier. So I just sanded it and, uh, I like the way it looks a lot. And, uh, also it just doesn't rust on me. All right. So that is the Spartan also from the ancient world, the ancient world, Greece. And, uh, by, by way of the Iberian Peninsula, I think. All right. So next up is based on the Spanish Navaja, my favorite folding knife through, uh, from history that I know of anyway. And, uh, here it is. This is my, my favorite version. I have four versions of the Espada. Uh, I have two this size, the large, and two XL, the seven and a half inch bladed one. I have one in the G10 version and then one in this uh, dressed up version with the aluminum bolsters and the polished black G10. Based on the Navaja, a knife that was adopted by Spaniards when they were no longer allowed to carry swords to saw, to uh, remedy their grievances, to solve their, their, their problems. They started carrying massive ratchet lock folders with clip point blades, a lot of them, many of them that you see, and these big curvy horned handles and, you know, carry them in their cummerbunds or in their waistbands or in their pockets or whatever. And uh, if someone, if someone besmirched their honor, out comes the Navaja. Now, I don't know about the process. I don't know what if they had to call each other out or if it just or conflict just erupted or whatever. What I do know is that if you're going to replace, if you have to replace a sword with something, uh, a giant folder that locks open is a, is, <laughs> is a great option. So a cool thing with this knife is all of the grip options. You can you can be all the way down here. You see this this little uh, sub hilt down here. You can be all the way down here uh, at the end of this horn and not have it slip out because you have this. And look at all that reach you get. Uh, this is a five and a half inch blade, so you you know get about nine inches of reach if you come all the way back here. But you have a bunch of different handholds on this on this uh, on this knife, and that is a very nice. Lee flat ground, large slab of S 35 VN. And, uh, I just love these dressy knives. I wish they would do more of them. How cool would it be for them to bring the Raja one back, which had this treatment? That's the Kukri, but with the aluminum bolsters and the polished G 10, how cool would it be if they had brought back the Talwar and given it that treatment? They did bring back the Talwar and we're all grateful for that, but it would be a great, it also reminds me of the Black Rhino, another knife they need to bring back. The Black Rhino had this aluminum bolster, polished G10, and it was a nice big uh, clip point blade. It looked like um, a sort of classic uh, slip joint hunting folder that I I don't really know the, the origin of, but the Black Rhino, bring it back, people. And and or cold steel people and and bring back the the polished bolsters, and G10. We we will buy them. We meaning me anyway. Okay, second to last penultimate knife of the day is the signature series Tylight Chris in 440C stainless steel. And look at this thing. This is a mashup. This is. Uh, if we're talking, this is an ethnographic mashup because it is a, an Indonesian or Malaysian Chris blade, that severe, that very wavy blade with, uh, uh, you know, on the mm, platform, on the Italian stiletto platform. That's what I'm trying to say. So basically we have two ethnicities here. We have uh, Malaysia 
or Indonesia, or, or I should say Malaysia and Indonesia and um, Italy here with the, so it's, it looks like a switchblade, giant switchblade. I love that cold steel has begun doing the crisp blade. Uh, I have a number of them. I have this one. I have the four inch version of this and then the uh, Voyager XL in the wavy bladed Chris. And I don't know when I was a kid, I thought the Chris blade, I had a good friend whose dad had a Chris blade up on his uh, wall in his den. And I always thought it was just kind of a fantasy shape or something that you pull out just to scare people with the looks. But it is an incredibly uh, effective uh, weapon type blade. You've got, it's it could, arguably could be utility too. With this tip, downward pointing tip, you could use that to open stuff. It, it, you could use that for utility cuts. But this is for slashing. This downward facing tip is great for slashing. And then these waves here in us in a slash act like serrations like large bread knife wavy serrations and we'll just dig and in a forward thrust as as the curves widen the wound channel widens so it is a very effective and very nasty blade shape and not just to be looked at and wowed over and it's not an easy blade shape to make whether you're forging it or a stock removing um, it's just very difficult and cold steel does an amazing job on their crisp blades and they get an incredibly uniform and sharp edge all the way on the wave without, without altering the depth or the height of the, of the grind or anything. So they do an amazing job. And this is a truly epic, uh, ethnic mashup knife here. All right, last, and I chose this last because Cold Steel came onto my radar in 1986 or whenever it was, ages and ages and ages ago, because of their Tanto, because they, they meaning uh, Lynn Thompson and, and uh, the company he was steering at the time, uh, recognized the Japanese Tanto for, its, for all of its great properties, but Americanized it, you know, turned, made it a little more faceted and angular and created kind of a new blade shape, the American Tanto. And uh, so that is a mashup of American and Japanese. And for Cold Steel, I figured it was the most emblematic of all their designs to show. So the last of the ethnographic or et ethnic folders here that I'm going to show is the Recon 1 Tanto. Oh, love these knives. These Recon 1 larges are now very uh, coveted. I've had a lot of people ask if they can buy these when, when I show them off, but no, I, it took me a while to, to find them and I really, uh, I dig them. Very broad, almost inch and a half thick bla uh, wide blade with a very thin hollow grind on most of it. This is XHP steel. And then of course up here you have your flat, everything very, very cold steel sharp. Uh, but like I mentioned before, if you look, these are the same year, same steel, but look at the coating difference. The uh, the Recon one on the bottom, the clip point is very matte, and the uh, Recon one on top is very kind of glossy. Not glossy, by comparison. By comparison. I always thought that was kind of interesting. And I like them both. <laughs> I like them both. I'm not sure. I, I, I like this on this, and I like the flat on the, on the Bowie, I got to say. So this blade shape was introduced for its Im impossible penetrative power because, you know, the, the knife maintains the full width of the blade almost to the point. And then the point is a, is a pretty, uh, pretty stout triangle there. And in cross-section, a three-sided pyramid that uh, will just pierce through anything, not anything. It will pierce through things like Kevlar or whatever, whatever they, whatever they were selling this as at the time, it will penetrate body armor. It will penetrate 55 gallon drums. If you work, you know, in customs or whatever, it'll go through car doors. If you're in the CIA and for some reason you need to do that. I remember that, that was the story that was told to me when I was in high school and I was like, Oh my God, I got to get that knife. Uh, so folding version of that, we all know what the Tanto is. Love it. I love it anyway. And um, 
I think it really rounds out this ethnic series quite well. So, so far we have, and so far meaning, uh, because this will be topped out when I do get a Talwar, because I think I've just convinced myself that I'm going to get a Talwar. So this list has been the Recon 1, Clip Point, the Raja 2, Kukri, the uh, Kab uh, Kabutowari, the Frenzy, um, the Gladius in the Immortal, we got the Kiridashi, the Ski and Do version, uh, or the Holdout 1, which is a Ski and Do, the Spartan, which is a Copus, we have the Espada here, which is the Navaja, which is what they should have called it, and uh, we have the, the XL Chris, Tylight, and the Recon 1 Tanto, and um, it's cool to have these all out. I'm glad to show them off. Uh, I'd like to do another tabletop video when I get uh, when I get that tall war, just because I think maybe at that point I will have finally rounded out uh, my collection of XL Cold Steels. Now, one thing I did neglect was the Luzon, which resides in my kitchen, not for kitchen use, but for uh, just to have it there. Uh, it is based on some of the Bally song folders that um, that Lynn Thompson has in his collection, but th these knives here that I've shown you are direct. You know, have a direct line. The Luzon is more in the spirit of. So I wanted to show you more uh, directly analogous knives. All right, that's a lot of words. Big word salad. I I hope you're full. I I hope that didn't overstuff you. But thanks for listening, nonetheless. Uh, this has been the Knife Junkie Podcast. Please be sure to join us on Patreon at theknifejunkie.com/patreon. Uh, leave a comment below, like and subscribe. That would be awesome too. Hit the notification bell. That lets you uh, kind of gives you a little reminder each time we upload a video. And check out our close-up videos, too. Be sure to join us on Thursday Night Knives, also in a Saturday, Sunday interview. Manaja. All right. I'm Bob DeMarco saying thank you. Thanks for watching. And thank you to Jim working his magic behind the switcher. Have a great one. And definitely, until the next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at the knifejunkie.com or call our 24 7 listener line at 724 466 4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the knife junkie podcast